something has to change. I know a lot of you have thought that, and I know at the beginning of the year, a lot of times you think that thought. Like something's got to change. Like you stand in front of the mirror, and you look at the mirror, and you're just like, something's got to change. Or you hold your Bible up at the beginning of the year, and you just say, I don't want the same year that I had last year. I don't want to go through the same thing that I, and so something has to change. That's what the beginning of the year always brings. The beginning of a year, the new year always brings change. And it brings this idea of change that we don't want to live and stay where we were, but we want to move forward. Nobody wants to move backwards. Everybody wants to move forward. And so sometimes we have to change what we're doing in order to be able to move forward. And so that's what this series and this concept kind of is. And we found ourselves kind of planted in the story of Moses as we're walking through this. And you remember last week, we looked at Moses and God's calling on his life. And he's standing at the burning bush. Well, now what we're going to do is we're going to track forward a little bit. And I just want to share with you one verse. And when I was growing up, I grew up in a private school and they would make us memorize verses. And sometimes they would just say, listen, you can pick a verse, any verse that you want, and you memorize that verse and this is a test score. And so for me, since I was just highly intellectual and since my memory was so great, I would always pick the hardest verses to memorize. And this is one of those hard verses that I picked to memorize. And so uh, Exodus chapter 8 verse 10 says this. Tomorrow, Pharaoh said. Tomorrow, Pharaoh said. I always got an A. And so I did really good. I passed. It was great. Um, But that's it. Like that little word right there means so much and carries such a heavy weight. My grandpa would often tell me this. He would say, Johnny, tomorrow never comes. And when I was little, less than 10 years old, I would argue with him. Yes, it does, Grandpa. Tomorrow is tomorrow. Like when I wake up, that's tomorrow. He goes, no, when you wake up, that's today. I'm like, no, that's tomorrow. No, tomorrow never comes. Yes, it does, Grandpa. Like I'm going to go to sleep tonight. I'm going to wake up tomorrow. He goes, no, you are going to wake up today. I'm like, no, today is today. And we would go back and forth and argue. But here's the thing. Tomorrow carries a lot of weight. And I want to show you why it's so important for us not to live tomorrow, but to live in the moment today, okay? And so let me explain to you kind of a little bit of what's going on, how Moses got to this spot in Exodus chapter 8. And so Moses was up on the mountain, the burning bush, everything like that, all that took place. Finally, Moses says, yes, God, I'll be obedient. I'll follow you. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'm, I'm in. And so Moses decided to be obedient, follow God. He goes and he presents himself to Pharaoh with his brother, in-law Aaron. And he goes and he stands in front of Pharaoh, Aaron standing next to him. And he says, here's what God says. Let the children of Israel go so that they may go worship him. Pharaoh looks at him and he says, first of all, who is this God that I should obey him and let the children of Israel go? No. Second of all, stop wasting my time and stop coming in here and telling me that they need to quit working so that they can go worship. You are wasting my time and you are distracting them. And so he looks at one of his officials and he says this, here's what I want you to do with the children of Israel now. I want you to go and I want you to tell them that I want the exact same quota that they've been given. The exact number of bricks that you make them produce every single day, I want them to continue to produce that number. But here's what I want you to do. Take the straw away. Take the straw away. They don't get straw anymore. Let them figure out on their own how they're going to do this because this is a waste of my time and you're distracting me. See, Moses had said yes to God. He had gone down to the children of Israel and he had told the children of Israel, God is calling me to lead you out of slavery into freedom, into the promised land that God has set up for us. The children of Israel, yeah, Moses, God has heard our cry. We love you. Yes, go get them. Moses stands in front of Pharaoh. Pharaoh turns up the heat. Moses walks back to the children of Israel. What have you done, Moses? What have you done? How could you let them do this to us? It was already a burden as it was, and we had the straw. Now we can't can't do this. You've created and given us something that there's no way that we can possibly accomplish this. Why have you come? Why have you said this? Why have you given us a promise that is not true? 
See, Moses was scared of his leadership. He was already nervous of the way that he was leading. He couldn't believe that somebody, I, God, they won't follow me. And now he, he decides to step out in faith and, faith and be the leader that God's called him to be. But all of a sudden, as he's stepping out in faith and as he's trying to lead, it doesn't go the exact way that he felt like it should. It's not laying out in the direction that he felt like this is going to go, this is going to happen, this is how it's going to be. It's not laying out that way. And he starts getting frustrated. Because sometimes life doesn't work out the way that we start drawing it out and painting the picture. Because when I was younger, I'm going to, you know, get married, have kids, you know, drive a Ferrari by, you know, 28, you know, have millions of dollars. Like, all, life has not exactly worked out that way. We have a Honda Odyssey. I, I'm ashamed to say that. I'm a 36-year-old with a Honda Odyssey. I need a cool car. But Moses looking and saying, it's not working out how I felt like it should. God says, go back to Pharaoh. Tell Pharaoh to let the people go. And if he doesn't, let's prove to him that I'm God. So Moses goes back to Pharaoh. God said, let the children of Israel go. And he said, no. <laughs> no. So Aaron takes his staff, throws it on the ground. When it hits the ground, it turns into a snake and it starts slithering all over the place. I don't like snakes, so I would have screamed and ran. But Moses and Aaron stood around and watched the snakes. Well, the, mag the magicians of Pharaoh grabbed their staff and they threw them on the ground and they turned into snakes. They were like, that's not impressive. We can do the same thing. Aaron's staff starts eating all the other snakes. Then Aaron goes over, picks it up, and just holds it and stands in front of Pharaoh and says, let the people go. He says, no. He says, okay, God's going to prove to you that he is God and you have to let these people go. So he goes out and they start performing these, what we know now as the 10 plagues. And we think of them often and we just kind of glance over them, but I want to show you how bad the 10 plagues actually were and how just uncomfortable life became because of these 10 plagues. The first one was this. He turned their water source into blood. And so what they drank... What they got and washed with and bathed with and used to drink from every day was now turned into blood. And so instead of being able to go out and get a cup of water, only the vampires in that day were able to go out and to... I'm joking. They, I, I don't know. But it, it was blood. And so now they're trying to bathe and they're just dumping blood all over them. They're trying to get a drink and it's only blood. Can you imagine living without water? Now, I know for us, it's a little different because we can run to the store and we've got bottled water now. Uh, we've got pop in bottles. We've got fountain drink. I mean, we've got everything that we could possibly want. And so we can stay hydrated. But can you imagine if that's your source of survival? Now, all of a sudden, it turns to blood. And on those hot days in Egypt, when you're out there working and you're just like, my throat's so dry. I just, I need some water. And you don't have anything to drink? And so Pharaoh calls Moses back in and says, Moses, please take this away. Okay, I will. But you have to let the people go. Fine, I'll let them go. Moses turns the blood back into water and Pharaoh changes his mind. So God sends a second plague. And God sends a plague of frogs. And the frogs are everywhere. The frogs go everywhere. It's an annoyance. And finally, Pharaoh says, okay, take these frogs away. I'll let the children of Israel go. Takes the frogs away, and then Pharaoh changes his mind. No, nope, I'm not going to let them go. Get to the third plague. Uh, the third plague is gnats. I don't know if you've ever been to an old watering hole, or it's hot and humid, and you find some water, and you've got those gnats just flying around, and you can just hear them in your ear, And you just try and get rid of them, and you can't, and, uh, and they're just all around you, and all, and they fly into your ear, and then it gets that one, and you just feel it in there, and you are trying to get it out all that you can, and it won't get out, and everywhere you look, you've got gnats everywhere, and they're just, and then they fly up your nose, and you're just, and you get a couple up your nose, and now you're just like, ah, and then you suck them down your throat, and you've got gnats everywhere. 
And you're just constantly, oh, oh, just trying to get them all. And there are gnats everywhere. And you can't get away. You go to your house, there's gnats. You get in your room, there's gnats. Outside, there's gnats. There's gnats everywhere. Pharaoh, finally, get rid of these gnats. Okay. Let the children go. Fine. Gnats leave. Changes his mind. No, they're not leaving. Next plague. Flies. I don't, have you ever been bit by a horse fly? Sucker hurts, man. Oh my goodness. But can you imagine walking outside and seeing flies everywhere? And then you're just uh, constantly just get them off me. And you lay down and they're just all around and they keep biting you. And you're just, and it drives you nuts. Okay, get rid of these flies, Moses. I'll let them go. Moses, flies are gone. Never mind, I'm keeping them. So then God sends the fifth plague, and he kills all the livestock. All the livestock drop dead. They're trying to haul them out. The stench is just getting nasty. Fine. You've even killed our future, because now we can't reproduce. Now we don't have any future because you've killed all of our livestock. Fine. We'll take the children. Nah, he keeps them. Six one, boils. I don't know if you've ever had a boil. I had a boil when I was younger. Um, we went to Africa. And while I was in Africa, I got a boil. I was in third grade, and I got a boil, and it swelled up about the size of my knee. It was massive. And those things hurt so bad. Like, I don't know what it is with boils and, like, popping them and seeing that pus run out, but my mom would grab my knee, and it would just seep all over the place. And every night she was having to just push that out. And that stuff would just just go all over the place. And I don't know why it is now, but I follow something on Facebook that's just (laughs) stupid that every time I'm scrolling through, somebody's popping something, a boil or something. And for some reason, I stop and watch it. And I just watch it and it's like, and it's like, and I'm just like, ah, And then the crazy thing is, I click on the next video, 45 minutes, like I'm sick to my stomach, and I'm just like, why am I watching this? But if you've ever had a boil, you know how much they hurt. Can you imagine having a boil right on the back of your leg and trying to sit in a seat, and every time you sit down, or having a boil right on your butt, and, and, and you're trying to sit down, and you're just uncomfortable, or on your back, and you try and lay down, or on your stomach, and, and you just can't get comfortable, because it's just so sensitive, and it hurts all over your body, and everywhere you touch, it's just sore, and hurts, and you're pussing out everywhere, and, and you just look so attractive for all the people around you, and you just got pus running all over the place. That's what, like, boils were everywhere. Everybody had boils. Facebook would have blown up. But here's the thing. Pharaoh looks and says, Moses, get rid of these. Get rid of them. You've got to get rid of these. Okay, let the children of Israel go. He promises. And then he takes his promise back. And so then God sends hail. And it's not the little hail that we get in Oklahoma where it dents our cars sometimes. It is hail that goes through windows. It is hail that destroys roofs. It is hail that kills anything that is outside. Trees, plants, brush, shrubs, anything. This hail is hitting it and absolutely destroying everything. And if you walk outside, this hail hits you in the head, splits it open, kills you. Like it has trapped you inside because it is so massive and so big and it just came down and came down and came down and came down and it destroyed everything and then pharaoh says take the hail away hail goes moses keeps the children of israel i mean pharaoh keeps the children of israel gets to the eighth plague god sends locusts locusts eat everything if anything was left from the hail the locusts took care of it And they are hopping all over the place and going all around. And they're just everywhere and they're chewing on everything. Moses, please get rid of these. And so he comes and he gets rid of them. He keeps the children of Israel. Sends the ninth plague, darkness. And he sends darkness. Darkness to a point to where people couldn't even see the hand in front of their face. 
So dark that they couldn't even go outside for days upon days because they could see nothing. I don't know if you've ever been in a spot where you've seen true darkness. To where you can hold your hand up in front of you. You can wave it in front of you like that and you can't see it at all. And you can pretend to slap yourself and you got nothing because it's so dark you can't see in front of you. I grew up on a farm and in that farm we didn't have any neighbors around us. And we didn't have any lights around us. And so we would, at, at night, you could turn all the lights off, hold your hand up, and you could not see it. When I was laying in bed, I could hold my hand up right here and I could not see it. Pitch black. Awesome. I mean, you could sleep forever. But then one day, my parents decided me to leave me home alone. That darkness changed. We had two big windows in our living room. And then the TV was right in between those windows. And I'm sitting there and I'm eating ice cream and popcorn, everything that I shouldn't be eating. I'm sitting there eating it, having a blast, and the sun starts going down. And it gets a little darker and it gets a little darker and it gets a little darker. And I'm staring out those two windows. And I know there's somebody looking in at me. I can't see them, but I can just feel it. It, it was just a woman's intuition came over me, and I knew it. I had that power for just a little bit, and I knew somebody, there is an axe murderer outside these windows, and he is staring at me right now, and as a 22-year-old, I mean, that's not a comfortable feeling. I'm joking. I was not 22. <laughs> Grief. <laughs> but as a, I mean, as a young boy, so home alone for the first time, staring out those windows, knowing there's eyes staring back at you, and it is pitch black. I was frozen, just sitting there, and I'm just watching out the window, like looking. Finally, I got some courage. I sprinted as fast as I could upstairs to my mom and dad's room, gripped open the closet door, grabbed every gun that my dad had ran downstairs, laid them all out on the floor, grabbed his shotgun, stood in front of the, the window, cocked it. I said, come on, sucker, you want some of me? Come on! And just stood there screaming at the window the rest of the night. Nobody ever came in. They got scared. It worked. They got scared. They never came in. But darkness does something. And for days, the Egyptians were in darkness that they could not even see. They could not even move. And finally, Pharaoh said, please take this away. And we're done. Time's up. I'm joking. <laughs> and he said, please take this darkness away. And Moses, the darkness left. But Pharaoh kept the children of Israel. And God said, Moses, I'm sending one more plague. This is the last plague. I'm killing the firstborn son. Because they have refused to obey me. And after this, Pharaoh will let the children of Israel go. But it's only after this. Prepare the children of Israel to leave. And so, Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, because you haven't let the children of Israel go, God's sending one more plague. And the death angel passed over. And there was weeping and crying throughout the night as the firstborn son died. But here's what I want to talk to you about today. Those 10 plagues are heavy, but there's one that sticks out to me more than any other plague. And if you go back to Exodus chapter 8, verse 10, God sent the plague of frogs, and Moses went and asked Pharaoh, Pharaoh, when do you want me to remove these frogs? And Pharaoh said, tomorrow. Tomorrow. I want you to understand how crazy this is because when we hear that, we're like, okay. But hear how crazy this is. Can you imagine? You're waking up in the morning. And when you wake up in the morning, you hear a ribbit, 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 ribbit. And as you're kind of opening your eyes, You've got a frog jumping on your forehead. And you're just like, what in the world? And you start moving. And as you start moving, you start feeling all this slime 
all this junk, all this yuck all over your bed. And you're like, what in the world? And you fling your sheets and flo- frogs fly everywhere. I mean, they are flying all over the room. You look under your covers and there are frogs underneath your covers. You jump out of bed and as you jump out of bed... There's frogs everywhere, and you're trying to hit the ground, but as you're hitting the ground, you're trying to push them out of the way, and as you're pushing them out of the way, there's so many, they crawl back under your feet, and and now you're stepping on them. And a dead, squished frog is not something that smells great. And so you're stepping all over them, and you're just trying to, what is going on? And, And you get to the bathroom, because that's the one spot. I mean, the one spot in the house that you just get to yourself, you get peace, like I'm taking a shower, I'm getting ready, like nobody bother me. And you go in there and sitting on the toilet seat are frogs. Swimming in the water in the toilet are frogs. You jump in the shower as you grab the soap in the shower, there's frogs sitting on your soap as you dump shampoo into your hair and you start scrubbing your hair, you start feeling frogs in your hair. And you can't get away from these things. And then finally you brush them all out and you get them all off of you. And you go to start brushing your hair and brushing your teeth. And you look and right as you put the toothpaste on your toothbrush, a frog jumps on your toothbrush and pees on your toothpaste. And then you look around and all the frogs are pooping and peeing everywhere. Everywhere. And you're trying to make your way to go have breakfast. And as you're trying to make your way to go have breakfast, you're pushing frogs out of the way. And then all you hear is this ribbit, 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 ribbit everywhere you're going. And you try and sit in the seat. But as you sit down, frogs are in the chair. You push them out of the way. You can't even sit down before more frogs jump in the seat. So now you're sitting down and you've squished some frogs. And you're sitting on frog guts. And you grab your cereal and you start eating. And you got frogs swimming around in your cereal. And you're just trying to have a meal. And you go to work and you're sitting there and you're trying to work at your computer and frogs are hopping all over you. And they're peeing and pooping on you. They're peeing and pooping around you. Everywhere you go, people are stepping on them and squishing them and the stench is horrendous. And finally you get back home from work And the horses have squash frogs everywhere. And everywhere you look, there's dead frogs, but there's also frogs hopping all over the place. And the stench is just terrible. And you just want just a moment of peace, but you can't get a moment of peace because there's frogs everywhere. Everywhere you look, there's frogs. And they're just all over the place. And you can't even step anywhere without stepping on frogs. And you're trying to just get... And you can't do it. And so finally, after dinner... And frogs have been jumping all over your stew. You're so frustrated. You're just like, I'm going to bed. I just need to sleep. And you go and you pull the covers back and there's frogs all under your sheets. And your your mattress is just filled with pee, with poop. You shove the frogs out. Get them off your covers. And you try and jump in and you try and tuck it in so tight. and that, I don't want a frog around me. You kind of pull it up over your head. And then you fill a couple down at your feet, hopping around. And you fill them all over you, jumping all up and down on your chest. You can just feel them everywhere. And it's now just bouncing on your head. And you just hear this ribbit, 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 ribbit in your ear all night long. And you can't sleep. Frogs are everywhere. Everywhere. Pharaoh, Moses, get in here. Get rid of these frogs. Moses looks at Pharaoh and says this. I'll get rid of them. You tell me when you want them gone. Now what I just described to you, what I, what I just told you, My response, now, immediately. Get rid of these frogs. I want them gone now. Out of here. I can't stand it anymore as I'm talking to you. There's frogs bouncing up and down on my head. I mean, they're everywhere. Frogs are everywhere, Moses. Get rid of them. Like, they're down my shirt. Like, I just, they're everywhere. Like, I just need, give me some peace. Now. And Pharaoh looks at Moses and says this. 
tomorrow. Tomorrow. I just want to spend one more night with the frogs. Just one more. We had so much fun last night. We played games. I counted them. I mean, they just talked to me all night. It was amazing. Like, I know a lot of you are thinking, oh, frogs aren't that bad. Like, if you go to a pond or go somewhere at night and you hear them chirping, like, that's pretty cool. Or croaking, not chirping. Frogs croak. Uh, and, and so you hear, do you know frogs? But can you imagine everywhere? It's not just a little chorus that they're singing. It is a loud, booming voice that they're just, ribbit, ribbit, everywhere. And Pharaoh says, I just want to spend one more night. And as we listen to that and we hear that, we can't help but think, Pharaoh, you're crazy. You're crazy to spend one more night with the frogs. But how many times has God pressed in on you and you said tomorrow? God pressed down and God said, there's some sin that's going on in your life. There's some things that's happening inside of you right now. There's some things that you continue to say yes to that I want you to say no to. And what you do is you say, okay, God, let's worry about that tomorrow. I'll I'll deal with that tomorrow. I'll take care of that tomorrow. And you choose to spend one more night with the frogs. Just one more. One more is not going to kill me. One more is not that big of a deal. One more is not a terrible, just one more. Here's the thing about tomorrow. The wisdom in my grandpa, tomorrow never comes. Because the excuses you have today are the excuses you're going to use tomorrow. Because if it's not important and it's not valuable to you today, then it's going to become less valuable to you tomorrow. If it's not your t- worth your time right now, it won't be worth your time tomorrow. And so what you have to understand is God's not raising up a group of people that he wants us to say, okay, God, I know I've got sin in my life. I, I know I've got all this junk going on. I know I need to get all this right. I, I know I've got all this. Like, God, I know I keep watching stuff on TV, on the computer that I shouldn't be watching. God, I know I keep saying things that I shouldn't be saying. God, I know I am keep doing things crooked in business. God, I know I keep treating my wife bad. I know I keep treating my husband bad. I, I know I keep doing these things. I know I'm not spending my money right. And, and God, I, I know all this stuff, but I, I'll get that tomorrow. Just, I, I'm just, just one more day. God, just one more time. God, just let me go out with my friends one more time and then we'll stop. Like, I know we shouldn't go to these places. I know we shouldn't do this. I, I know we shouldn't be there. I know we shouldn't be talking. But God, just one more time, then I'll get right. God, one more time, then I'll stop. I had a friend of mine who was dealing with alcoholism. And he had, it was so bad that he couldn't function without it. Literally shaking literally sick to his stomach and throwing up. That's how reliant he had become on it. But it got to the point he was losing his family. And it was so bad that his family was threatening to leave him and he would call me and he would say, Johnny, I don't know what to do. I, 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 want, I don't want to lose my family. They're the most precious thing to me. Stop. I can't. How about tomorrow? No. It was so bad in the glove compartment of his car. He had liquor in his desk. He had multiple bottles of liquor. At home, you would open up cabinets and he had liquor everywhere. And I said, if you want to do this, it's a decision you make now. You can either choose to make the decision now and choose to make a change now or you're going to be in the same situation tomorrow. And tomorrow, your family might not be around. And he fought it, and he fought it, and he fought it, and he always put it off to tomorrow. Now, his family's falling apart. His kids are gone, have nothing to do with it, and he drinks every single night. Because his decision was, I'll face it tomorrow. I'll deal with it tomorrow. 
I'll, I'll deal with that issue tomorrow. I, I know me and my wife, we're not getting along right now, but I'll deal with it tomorrow. I, I know my kids, we're not getting along. I know at work, it's not happening, but I'll deal with it tomorrow. See, the problem with tomorrow is that if you don't value it today, you won't value it tomorrow. Because what is valuable is valuable today. And so if, if it's important to you, if God is pressing in on you, then you have to value it today. That's why I put a frog in everybody's chair. So that when you leave today, you can put it in your bathroom, you can put it in your car, and you can see and you can look at that frog every single day and you can say, God, what is it that you're calling me to? What is it that you're asking me to do? What is it that you're pressing in on me that I continue to put off? That I continue to say, I'll deal with it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll make a difference tomorrow. God may be pressing in on you and saying, listen, there's some family members in your family that need Jesus. There's some family members that you need to share the love of Jesus with. And you need to get serious and you need to let them know that you can't play around with God. That you can't just ignore God. But that they need to give their heart and their life to Jesus Christ and they need to get right with Jesus. Maybe you need to be sharing that with them and what you do is you make excuses. But God, they know me. They know I've made mistakes. They know I've messed up. What if they ask me a question and I don't know how to answer I'll, I'll read my Bible a little more, I'll pray a little more, and, and then tomorrow, tomorrow, I'll talk to them. Tomorrow, I'll share with them. Tomorrow, I'll tell them about Jesus. T tomorrow. See, the problem with that is I had a friend do that exact same thing. I had a friend do that exact same thing. God was pressing in on him. He knew that his friend was lost. And God was pressing in and saying, you need to share the gospel with him. I can't today. We went out drinking last night. I can't today. We talked about this. I can't today. And he kept making excuses and he kept saying, I'll do it later. Until one day he picks up the phone. And one of his buddies called him and said, hey. He got in the car wreck and he's dead. Tomorrow is not promised. Proverbs 27.1 says this, don't boast about tomorrow because you don't know what a day will bring don't brag about what you're going to i'll do it tomorrow i'll get right with god tomorrow i'll share my faith tomorrow i'll witness to my family tomorrow i'll invite them to church tomorrow i'll do what god's called me to do tomorrow i'll stop living the way that i know i shouldn't be living tomorrow see the problem is you're not promised tomorrow it could be your last God, tomorrow, I'm just going to spend one more night, just one more. This is it. This is the last time I do it. This is the last time I look. This is the last time I go there. This is the last time I say this. This is the last time I, I say no to God. Tomorrow, I'll share my faith. Tomorrow, I'll make things right with my wife. Tomorrow, I'll make things right with my husband. Tomorrow, I'll ask for forgiveness. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. And the bottom line is this. You don't have tomorrow. See, the problem with Christianity to, today is this. We're living like we're promised tomorrow. If we would live with the reality that tomorrow is not a guarantee, then it changes everything. I no longer put the phone down and, and don't pick up the phone and, and call my friends and say, you need Jesus. What would you give to know how much time you had left on earth? To know you had you know, six months to live. Three weeks ago, Naomi, she was here from the beginning, um, walked down the aisle when we had church and the doctors had just given her six months to live. She walked down, she struggled coming down, she was not doing good, sickness had taken over her body. In less than a week, she had passed away. Less than a week. See, some of you are holding on to tomorrow. I'm just going to spend one more night. Just one more night. God, I'll open your word. 
I'll get in your word. I'll read the Bible. I'll pray tomorrow. I'll start tomorrow, God. Tomorrow morning, I'll set my alarm early. I'm going to get up and I'm going to do it tomorrow. Then the problem comes, the alarm goes off, something happened the night before, and you're tired. And you hit snooze. And you hit snooze. And you hit snooze. And you look and you go, okay, God, I promise tomorrow. I promise I'm getting up tomorrow. I promise everything is changing tomorrow. I promise I'll stop acting this way tomorrow. I I promise I'll stop saying these things. I promise I'll dig into your word. I promise I'll pray tomorrow. Tomorrow. Frogs were everywhere. Everywhere. Mm, Pharaoh said, let me spend one more night with them. Just one. Just one more night with the frogs. What are you spending one more night with that God's begging you? Today is the day. Today's the day of your salvation. Today's the day for your change. Today's the day for your promise. Today's the day for your calling. Today's the day for your worship. Today. But you keep saying tomorrow, God. Tomorrow. 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 We look at Moses, we look at Pharaoh, and we say, this is the most crazy thing I've ever read. Who would do that? And God's looking down and he's saying, you. 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 You keep saying tomorrow to him. God, tomorrow I'll be obedient and change jobs. Some of you, God's calling you out of what you're doing right now into what he created you for. But you keep saying, I can't, God. Finances don't match up. I can't do it. I'm comfortable where I'm at. And you become comfortable, and your comfortable has caused you to say tomorrow. Some of you, your marriage is falling apart, and you keep saying tomorrow we'll go to counseling. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll get help. Tomorrow we'll talk to somebody. For some of you, your kids are just wild and crazy and you don't know what to do. Tomorrow, tomorrow we'll deal with it. Some of you worship. God, tomorrow, next Sunday I'll worship you. Next Sunday I won't, I won't, I won't imagine anybody in the, it's just me and you, God, and I'll worship you next Sunday. And God's saying, no, today, today's the day. The moment is now. For you to make a decision. Tomorrow? Tomorrow? What is it God's pressing on your heart right now? What is it God's saying to you that you need to deal with that is the frog in your life? Will you deal with it today? Will you do business with God today?